Welcome. So congratulations, you've made it this far in my cryptography crash course. And yeah, if you are just jumping in, you can start from the beginning if you need the absolute foundation of symmetric and asymmetric encryption and all that junk. This episode, we're going to be talking just a little bit about elliptic curve encryption. And then we're also going to be talking about digital signing and how that works. If we get there, we'll find out. Pluralsight, it's one of the first learning platforms I used as a software developer. You can get a completely free trial and start learning by following a path on pretty much anything. The learning paths combine numerous courses giving you the step-by-step -step path to reach your goals. Or you can find individual courses on pretty much anything. Maybe you want a class on cryptography, security, Python programming, networking, maybe Java, you name it, and they probably have it. I can genuinely say that Pluralsight helped me advance my skills and my career. I'll leave a referral link in the description, go check it out. So elliptic curve cryptography is a form of asymmetric cryptography. And again, just so we're on the same page, the way this works is you got two keys. I mean, if you know this already, you're probably sick of me saying it, but just follow along for just a minute. The blue one's private, this one is public. And these are digital keys. These, these aren't the actual keys you're gonna be using for the encryption. And you can use the public one to encrypt anything. So this is your magical encrypting key. But you can only decrypt it with this one. And that is also how elliptic curve encryption is going to work. You're gonna have a public key and you're going to have a private key. Here is an image illustrating how it works. Bob can encrypt a message using Elise's public key to send it to Elise in which at that point, Elise can decrypt it using her own private key. If she wanted to respond, she would just reverse that and use Bob's public key for the message she's going to send to Bob and Bob would use his private key. So the difference here, and I'm not gonna pretend like I know what I'm talking about here, it, it, it deals with the math of how the encryption algorithm actually processes the data. So there's various things in math that can allow encryption to work. So you can deal with factorization, you can deal with logarithms, or you can use the elliptic curves, which is what the elliptic curve cryptography does. So for example, RSA is related to the integer factorization problem. So that's the, the type of math that that uses. And the, the Diffie-Hellman, which we talked a little bit about in the previous episode for the initial exchange of private keys, and DSA, those are related to the discrete logarithm problem, which you can learn about if, if you're so interested. And the elliptic curve cryptography is based on problems using elliptic curves. So an elliptic curve is just something defined by this equation. So uh, here's an, a bunch of different example of elliptic curves. So yeah, I have a friend who is like super good at math. Uh, maybe I can pull him in on this channel and he can dissect some of this for us at a, at a deeper level because I don't actually... Claire, how dare you? I am a married man. I know it doesn't appear so. Hoes be thirsty. <laughs> I should not say that. So as I was trying to say, I have a friend who is pretty good at the math stuff. Maybe I can pull him in on this channel and he can discuss a little bit more about the, the functionality in these algorithms, how they work to actually do the encryption. But that's all I'm gonna be talking about in, in this series on the math part. But the magic part of the elliptic curve cryptography is that you can get more potent encryption with a smaller key. So you can see in this article, ECC or elliptic curve cryptography requires smaller keys compared to non-EC cryptography. So again, NordLocker, the file encryption software that I partnered with, I'll leave a link in the description. They use elliptic curve cryptography. So in this situation, it, it mentions that a 256-bit ECC key provides a level of security equivalent to a 3072-bit RSA key. Now again, going back to what we talked about with keys, each bit for the, the RSA keys doubles the, the essentially the difficulty to guess that key. So a 3072 bit key is like two to 3072 different possibilities for that key. So guessing that key is theoretically impossible, at least today. <laughs> It would also appear that there is an elliptic curve version of the key exchange agreement that we talked about in, in previous episodes. 
So this is basically a way to share a private key secretly. So that, that way you can then switch to symmetric encryption. So this is just a variant of the original Diffie-Hellman protocol. I'm hoping I'm saying that right, but I'm not entirely sure. Now, just to continue being a video form of Wikipedia articles, the, the Wikipedia article on elliptic curve cryptography also mentions the, the 256 being the equivalent to a 3072-bit RSA public key. There is mention about concerns with quantum computing, and that is probably a, an entire topic of its own. Uh, I don't think quantum computing is there yet, but I'm also very confident that quantum computing will grow at, at a, an unsurpassed rate. So I, I'm excited and also nervous just to see where that goes, but obviously as computers get better and faster and, and revolutionary, the encryption algorithms are also going to improve and new ones will come to be. So it's, it's not necessarily that quantum computing is going to come in here and destroy all forms of encryption, at least to my understanding, but um, I'm also not an encryption master. Contrary to popular belief, I know it's crazy. Now, I have read that some people are hesitant to implement the elliptic curve encryption due to patent concerns. Now it's not that you can't use elliptic curves, but there are certain patents out there, so, so maybe you have to be a little bit more careful. There's at least one ECC scheme and some implementation techniques that are covered by patents. And also ECC is newer than the, the RSA algorithm, so I think that's probably why RSA is used more common. That's what people know. It's it's been trusted for the, the time has allowed it to kind of build trust. Since it hasn't been broken yet, people have realized that it works, whereas the ECC is newer and maybe harder to implement, a little bit harder to understand, and also there might be some patent concerns. So I think the acceptance of ECC has just not been as much, but overall I think it is a, a good solution. So we have just covered the basics of elliptic curve cryptography and cryptography in general so far in this series. If you have a lot of experience in cryptography, we definitely want to hear your input. What do you think about these different encryption algorithms and what are their pros and cons? Let's start some discussion in the comments section below. And what is up next? Well, the, the cryptography is, is useful for sending messages and receiving messages to being able to encrypt and decrypt. But there's also another thing that these algorithms are useful for, and that is for digital signatures. In other words, how can we verify that a message was not altered? So these algorithms can come up in digital signatures, and you can digitally sign a message so that receivers can confirm that the message is authentic and that it wasn't modified in transit or verify that someone else didn't create the message. So that is a magical part, I swear. <laughs> so that is a magical part about these algorithms that is related to cryptography, but is not exactly the same thing. So I'm gonna include it in this series because it's definitely relevant, but digital signatures are not exactly the same thing as cryptography. We're going to get into that in the next episode and take a look at things like ECDSA, which is elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. This is a thing used in, in Bitcoin to confirm a transaction and make sure that it is authentic. And these things are really cool and can be used for lots of different things, such as ensuring that files are the correct files and ensuring that messages came from the right place and that they were not tampered with in the process. So let's get into that in the next episode. Stay tuned. Please be sure to subscribe and I will see you there.